Good evening and welcome to the Town of Auburn Planning Board meeting, Tuesday, May 24th, 2016. <coughs> now called to order at approximately 7 p.m. The meeting is being recorded and broadcast by local access programming. Is there anyone in the audience tonight that is uh, recording tonight's meeting? Okay, there being none, please rise and join us in a moment of silence for Officer Tarantino and Roger Bowen. Join us in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Discussion for the Whitetail Run Bond Estimate Performance Guarantee, if you want to come to the table. Maybe you should. Yeah. What's that? Uh, sure, why not? Well, not only. <laughs> right. So you received the um, engineering and survey uh, site work for Whitetail Run off Brook Street in Auburn. And we've also received a letter from Bill Coyle that the uh, engineer's office is in agreement with the estimate uh, as presented. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Matt? Uh, just, if I may, uh, just detail the process from here. Great, thank you. Uh, so, having received the estimate uh, from the engineer based on the weighted bid prices, from SDOT, Ty Engineer has reviewed that and offered its approval. From here, now that the board is so inclined to approve the amount, the applicant will pursue a performance guarantee. It sounds like a tri-party agreement. Tri -party agreement, wherein uh, the draft agreement would be sent to the town, forwarded to town council for review, along with something that I would prepare, which is the lot releases of lots one through seven and the release of the covenant. All documents be reviewed by town council at that time, returned to us our future meeting uh, for a vote to release the covenant, release the lots, and execute the performance guarantee. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, uh, to the chair, uh, the next uh, move would be to vote to uh, uh, approve the amount presented for okay. the bond estimate. I want to obtain a motion to approve the bond estimate. Um, make that motion to the comment that the board will likely be looking at that point for some type of performance timeline um, for when you think the work will be completed so that we can sign that with the uh, bond covenant just so that you're preparing yourself for yeah. it now and thinking about it. So I make that motion. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. Rafa, anything to add? Mr. Brooks? Mr. Weaver? Mr. Faber? Nope. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 
I don't want to do this. They're already up here. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I just want to take the opportunity to introduce Amanda LaFrance uh, to the planning board. She's interning here at Town Hall in the Planning Department from Westfield State and will be with us probably at future meetings throughout the summer until she goes back. So a double major in regional planning and environmental science, and we're happy to have her. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks nice for being here. <laughs> okay, 705, applicant Marie T. Baker requesting a special permit for a hammerhead lot under section 5.3.2 of the Urban Zoning Bylaws for the construction of a single family dwelling at 310 Leicester Street. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Please yeah, introduce yourself. Yeah. George Kurtz here. I represent the applicants. Uh, with me tonight is the engineers, and I know you met before, and this matter has been continued to matter for a, a few uh, sessions. We went back during the during this process and reviewed uh, the division of this property as an A and L plan, approval not required plan. I know the board that's not directly in front of the board, but I know that there's been some discussions as to whether or not that would have been a more appropriate uh, vehicle for the division of the property. So we explored that. I know I've submitted a, a letter, of, an opinion letter to the board relative to real drive and whether or not that should serve as a uh, private way uh, that would give rise to the rights under the approval not required portion of the subdivision control law. And we understand that that might have been reviewed by town council. If that's, the board is inclined to look favorably upon that approach, uh, we would hope to be doing an a and R plan on the property rather than uh, the uh, current application for a special permit and we would withdraw our application for a special permit uh, probably, hopefully at the next meeting. Um, so uh, I guess my, my question is would the board look favorably on that kind of application, in the Form C application rather than a uh, uh, special permit. Uh, through the process in the subdivision control. Uh, yeah. to, to the chair, uh, just question for Attorney Gray. You mentioned the Form C, that's the definitive subdivision. Oh, uh, Form A, I'm sorry. Okay. Form A. All right. You're absolutely right. So, uh, and furthermore, um, mm -hmm. uh, having uh, spoken with Town Council about this uh, and, and, and Attorney Kuritsi's letter, and thank you for providing us with uh, some good information. So, uh, we also reviewed some key documents and information dating back to the 20s, uh, some far back. And a lot of the deeds read that it's a 20 foot right away on a proposed street for a period of 80 years. It never had a name. But it does uh, reference it as a proposed road for, for a very long time. Um, at some point within the last 20 years, it, it got one name as, as Tulf Way, and then at another point got a name as Real Drive or an AKA Real Drive. So, uh, Despite never actually being called an actual road, it was 310 West Street, also known as. And but that doesn't detract from the fact that it's been a st or referenced as a potential proposed street. So, regardless of of that, whether it predates subdivision control or or, or not, the the new development for ANR would subject at least the street to become passable, accessible, emergency vehicles, etc. Um, which is something the board will want to consider if an AR application comes, comes before them. There's also several instances in the past uh, over planning board applications over time where people have proposed building on private roads, as, as we all know, uh, including some even more recently than others, where uh, engineering or, or, or fire have recommendations that prove that the road needs to be uh, improved upon to make uh, accessible for emergency vehicles, etc. So I think it's fair to say that given what we've seen or at least from what i've seen of this road uh, i think you could fit maybe a car down it and i think that car needs to have four-wheel drive for one but i, I know it's 20 foot right of way and all but uh, 20 feet's not nearly cleared for here I don't know, the driveway and that works. but the second you add three lots to it i would imagine and having spoken to some departments that some road improvements may be required here and that's not something that the board can necessarily regulate through the ANR process, but would be best to regulate through the subdivision review process. So, and again, my opinion alone, but I think the, what's in front of us now is a special permit being proposing a hammerhead lot on a, uh, with a common driveway doesn't 
it doesn't uh, give the road credit as, as we're trying to both uh, agree on here. And I don't think the town's necessarily opposed to it being a street, which it seems to have some credentials for, but I think uh, it's in the town's best interest to make sure that it's accessible for any future lots that are developed on it. I would say that it would have to be <coughs> brought up fully to town standards with the drainage and everything else. I mean, that's 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 for one car, like he said, with four-wheel drive or something like that. That's not any type of a passable. That's like a tractor path. And, uh, <coughs> to put a common driveway even up there as they lead into the, for the Hammerhead lot, that in my mind is not acceptable either. Mr. Rothrock? Well, most of our roads we uh, now demand a 24-foot wide road to begin with, so 20 foot's not going to cut it. Well, it's only about eight, Jimmy, but it's a 20-foot right of way. Right. So you, we we require 40 to 50 now, I think, with right. a 33-foot road maximum. Uh, we usually only require 24 paved. Then we can, if it was something different, we could say we can, you know, go 18 or 20 paved or something less than that. You know, we usually sometimes waive that, but not, <clears throat> not that. I, I would suggest, if I may, uh, through the chair, the the current proposal that we're contemplating is. Um, just one additional lot at the back. So, it, it, you know, if there were going to be a subdivision application, it, it's what we're what we're proposing is, if, if I may, call attention to the, the plans that we have. So, the entire parcel would be divided into three parcels: one with the current existing house, this one in <coughs> front, which already has frontage on Leicester Street, uh, so there'd be no additional frontage requirements from real drive uh, so these two are already a and r i mean those because they take their frontage off of Leicester street so to you know to require one additional lot uh would we probably would hopefully not have to bring that up to uh full subdivision requirements sidewalks I mean, for one additional lot in the back Excuse me. We haven't uh, we haven't seen that. No, that this is this is what plan. when we so when we first began looking at uh, and this is what my first involvement was was to look at the possibility of um, instead of doing uh, him ahead lot under the uh, special permit process divided under the A and R process uh, obtaining frontage off of real drive. Mm -hmm. So that's why we I originally looked back to determine whether or not real drive would qualify from what just statutorily whether or not it would qualify for A and R approval under subsection C of the, the statute. And it appears that though it was a pre-1956 uh, private way. Now whether or not it, in the opinion of the planning board it provides, it provides access, um, that would be another issue that would be a requirement under the statute that the board could then opine on. But we're you know, we're really we're looking to add one additional lot at the back of the property. So to upgrade this to a full um, subdivision, I mean, if that were the case, we'd probably be coming in and looking for a lot more lots on the subdivision because the property it would be able to acquire um, quite significant. Uh, you know, with frontage breaking these down with all the frontage, you'd actually have a pretty sizable development, maybe six or seven. Uh, lots. We're looking only to get uh, one additional lot. That's why we thought, as an A and R plan with one uh, additional lot, that might be the way to uh, proceed. Uh, and, and so the A and R is for the lot in the front or the lot in the rear. The, this would be an A and R lot. Okay. That would get its frontage off of Leicester Street. Street. This is an A and R lot that would get its Hammond frontage head. off of not a human head. Okay. It's a, it would be actually a. Uh, um, a, uh, an A and R lot whose frontage comes off of real drive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the application we have before us specifically says special that it's permit. a special permit for a hammerhead lot under section 5.3.2 zoning bylaws for the construction of a single family dwelling at 310 Leicester Street. It has nothing to do with real drive or whatever it is. 
your application is strictly for 310. 100% right. I, I don't mean to, um, to detract from what the application is before the board. Mm -hmm. during, the, during the process, we reviewed an alternative which we would come in if the board was receptive to an A&R application we would withdraw our application for the special permit. Um, and I know this matter went out. I was asked to give my legal opinion. I know that it's been reviewed by town council, or I, I, I hear that it had been reviewed by town council um, <coughs> as to whether or not this would have been an alternative uh, to our special permit application. If the board wants to go forward on the special permit application, you know, we're more than happy to go forward on, on that application, but we're probably going to be back looking for uh, an ANR uh, determination. Okay. John, um, uh, does the applicant have any plans under any format to upgrade the existing driver? I think part of where the board is stuck is that if you're reviewed under one case, then you're making the argument that it's not a public way um, and it's just a really tough driveway, and there's also some other legal issues with sharing the driveway. Um, when we go the other way, then you want it to be a public way, in which case we'd be approving a very subpar, um, you know, private way. Um, I, I don't know if the board is opposed, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but, but personally I'm not opposed to adding a lot back there. I think it's just a matter of showing that we've done our diligence and provided the adequate access that's required in order to make sure it's safe. Um, and, you know, any conditions that anybody else would have to go through if they did a hammerhead lot, they'd have to provide access. Um, so is there any plan to upgrade, upgrade, the, upgrade the existing in. way under either scenario? I think under, um, I mean, I, I believe there's going to need to be some kind of work done on that way anyways, you know, to, to accommodate um, just the, the houses there. Um, I don't believe that they were planning on bringing them to subdivision uh, specs, mm -hmm. that being 24 foot wide paved sidewalks, you know, drainage, um, because it, it, certainly I understand when you're adding <coughs> that kind of width, with that kind of pavement, without amount of houses and impervious, you have to then provide for um, stormwater management, you're gonna have to provide for drainage. But on this, which is a relatively uh, small expansion of the current uses there. We would hope that that would not have been that would not be required, given this level of the. <coughs> if we were if we if we're going to be looking at a full development with drainage and um, yeah, with drainage, sidewalks, uh, with, with which is available because they certainly have the area to do that. If we but if we were going to be putting in with drainage, pavement, sidewalks, the whole subdivision requirements, we might as well look at six or seven lots because that's what the property would yield. So instead of looking at a full board development, we're looking at a scaled back, almost a hybrid. We're going, we're going modest increase in density with the current, you know, we can certainly probably widen it a few feet, but there's all, on, on this road, there's still only gonna be two houses access that right now there's only one regardless if there's one house or two houses there still needs to be clear access for emergency vehicles and things of that nature if there's a fire you want a fire truck to be able to get down there to okay yep. so that's really where you know mr brooks does the topography in that area because i've never been up in there allow for buildable lots We've scaled yes, out. You would get scaled out the lots, and they've scaled out the total. And the the other thing is, if it's a hammerhead, it's we're also looking at the provision that it's a common driveway for both. And I'm not sure if we have that in the bylaw. That they're not no. permitted no. in uh, residential. I believe that we changed that. Uh, so that's an issue. So if it's comes up to, you know, we don't, as I said, expect. I mean, if I looked at that right now and it was a 14-foot paved roadway and in decent shape, that would probably be all right or something like that. But, you know, but we have an obligation to the other people that are going to live up there mm -hmm. and to the, to the safety of those people. <laughs> we just can't leave that like that. If I could add to uh, 
Excuse me. I think we got just a moment, Mr. Ruff. You know, basically, what we should do in this particular case, you really don't know where you want to go here. And, and well, you don't know whether you want a uh, special permit for a hammerhead lot with a single dwelling up there to only be a single dwelling up there, or, you know, you've, you've brought in a lot of other things here, or you want an A&R off of a, off of a uh, town road. Basically, what I think you should do is I think you should withdraw this, and we could we could actually uh, give him a uh, uh, withdraw without prejudice. Right, withdraw without prejudice. All right, and come back with the actual plan that you want to do. Either that, or we'll vote on the Hammerhead lot for a single for a uh, on a special under a special permit with a single dwelling here. I think that the board members see where I'm getting at there. So we could do that. We could make we could continue it for another week if they want to think about it and come back and I mean we're not. Mr. Weaver. Yeah I think we're, we're really kinda of at a discussion phase here as opposed to at a yeah. really <laughs> being a hearing phase. Mm -hmm. um, you know I think it may make some sense, I don't know what the town's opinion would be on looking at this under the subdivision guidelines, but providing relief to an acceptable standard, whatever the town was to determine that to be, that also then the board could accept, um, whereby we have the ability to go through and, and make that road to an acceptable standard that's safe, safe and meets the town's guidelines. But we actually have a, a the board has a, has a method through which we can um, condition that as a requirement. Mr. Brooks. And I suggest that maybe you would talk to the highway surveyor and see what he might think. No, we're not making it up to a, you're not wanting to make it, we're not asking to make it up to a full size town road, but what would be something that would be acceptable to him. Did you want to add something? Uh, just uh, kind of the restrictions for the existing conditions for the, having to complete the subdivision road with a fish foot right away. We've got the uh, utility poles through the drive where they're kind of restricting us. We've got wetlands. There's a electric easement in the back too. We can't go too much further on the back too. So we wouldn't be expanding the, if it was a subdivision in the back, more than one lot in the back. And we wouldn't want to relocate the uh, the telephone poles. The existing utility poles will be out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, one oh, question, actually. Um, this a and plan, which we're yet to see, this looks new. Um, this would establish a road because right now the real drive or the, the way doesn't have actual delineation. It's considered a right away with equal rights to each side for the properties. That's uh, just looking at maps that date back. So this a and here would actually give it a 20, what is that? Does that say 20 feet wide? 20 foot width. Yes. Right. So that would actually establish it as a road, because right now it doesn't exist as one. Well, on paper, but all, despite the deeds that date it back as a proposed yeah. way for almost 90 years. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting point, not to mention right smack in the middle of that, you have wetlands, and how the board would want to consider improvements to this road, knowing that this wetlands across that cross it come to the other side as well. Uh, not, not thinking of drainage in that regard is, is, is scary to me. Are we able to drive up there if we want? Oh, certainly. Yes. I mean, it's right. Here's the I thing: is the DPW, up. from what I understand, DPW maintains it now. They plow it in the winter as it is. Um, you don't so fill it or pave it, though. Mm -hmm. right. Was that? It is plowed, but it isn't filled or no, it's, paved. No, it's not paved. paved. And we recognize it's a gravel way. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, as, it, as it is right now, it, it services one, mm -hmm. one house. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Weaver. Uh, did, did this go to a DCG meeting at any point? Because it, it strikes me that this is a... Yes. Okay. This is, it's a more complicated site than a typical mm -hmm. hammerhead right. lot that would normally come before the board. And be easy mm -hmm. um, it's also got challenges you know, in the way of an airplane. So I might suggest to go back, talk with the town a little bit, try to reach some kind of agreement with the highway director and the town planner as to what 
might meet their minimum standards and then reapproach. So we, can, we can either withdraw or we can continue. Um, but as it stands, again, I, I concur with Mr. Rocha that it's not clear really what route you'd like to go here, and, and we are here to address a hammerhead lot under 5.3.2. Now, do you have 50 feet that you're going to show with it? For the, because the hammerhead lot frontage is a minimum of 50 feet. Yes, we had shown that before. Regardless of what you have to yes. bring up to standard or anything, but you need to show, you know, that minimum. If the whole handle was a 50 you know, foot wide. It's, I mean, you know. Yeah. I, I think the board, as well as myself, needs some time to examine that, which is an ANR. Yeah, I believe it's a future A&R plan. Is that that is? That. That's a rendering for a future A&R. Okay, so this one, that is a submitted, I believe, it should come before the board, yeah. probably at the same time as the hammerhead lot, so you can examine both, op both options, having reviewed the information. So would you like to continue? This? That's what we would hope. We would hope, to, instead of withdrawing the special permit, we would hope to continue it, present the A&R. If the board's inclined to... Uh, grant the A and R would would uh, withdraw the the uh, special permit application and just go forward on the form A. Is that how that's done? It can't be done that way. We've, we've never done. Just spell it out. Say it out again. No, we've never done that before. But spell it out again. It, it's a parallel track. Right now we have an open special. Uh, we have an open public right. hearing on the special permit during the. The process during the uh, the uh, special permit process. This concept was developed independent of the special permit process, and, and you know certainly it's not it, it's not one of the it, it wasn't part of the special permit. But if that real drive is a private way, then we can avoid the special permit, which is extraordinary zoning relief, and go straight under subdivision uh, approval not required provisions and obtain the same result without deviating from uh, standard zoning. So that's the reason why we explored that. It says, oh, you know, the light bulb goes off and says, we don't need the special permit if real drive serves as a, as a private way. So that's why we explored that. Now we come, so that's why my original letter went to you saying, my thoughts are abandon the special permit, go in for A and R. That's been reviewed, we understand, by town, town council. That's what we want to do. However, we don't want to find ourselves with neither vehicle before you. Mm -hmm. um, and since the permit, is the, the, public, the special permit's already going on, I don't know why we couldn't proceed them both parallel. If the board's inclined to look at the ANR favorably, we withdraw the special permit at the next, at the next hearing. Um, well, I'll, yeah, I'll... I'll I, what I will say is, if it, if you proceed with the ANR, which would be in the auspice that that is considered to be a public way, or whatever, it would I would be in favor only if it was updated to a considerable degree over what I look at right there. I don't think anybody has the objection to the lot of being back there. It's it's got to have a minimum. It's got to have something, even if it's a hammerhead lot. It's got to have at least. 12 feet of paved or something like that, if we agree that it would be common. Yeah. Uh, just regarding that, and I think that's a good point, uh, the road certainly needs some sort of renovation in, in its own sense, but through the NR process, we wouldn't be able to regulate that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got to get inventive. I've told clients, I've told clients, I've told clients that the statute doesn't say that you can't do the improvements on a private way first and then approach the board. So, um, you know, the statute says that in the opinion, so that if I got an old private road and I expand it, you know, widen it or whatever, and then come in, it's still uh, a private road uh, that predates the uh, subdivision. So, you know, that's something that we can we certainly explore. Um, the other alternative, of course, is abandon the sub the uh, A and R process and go to subdivision and ask for a million waivers because it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to do a subdivision and put in you know 24 foot wide pavement for 
two houses. Yeah. Uh, just furthermore on that point for subdivision, uh, our regulations allow applicants to ask for waivers right. from just about anything in the regulations. Uh, given the small scale of this development, I'm sure, and I'm not speaking for everyone, you're not going to want two sidewalks on both sides of the street, yeah, yeah. Or, or for that matter. So, uh, I believe that is a we issue waivers all the time. Yeah. Right? You know? yeah. John, I think my, my only suggestion is that I think the town is very fortunate to have a very reasonable uh, planning director and a very reasonable highway director, <coughs> um, and it might be in your interest to have a few conversations with them, see what they might recommend and then the board could review that with Excellent. more authority. Yeah, we'd love to have all the information that we need okay. to make a sound decision. So would you like to continue? We respectfully request to continue. Okay. Well, do we need to sign an extension? Pardon? Any comments for public? they with us. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have one. Sure. The your road's name, your been name made. And address, please. Oh, I'm uh, Jim Baker. I'm uh, the owner's and your son -in -law. Mm -hmm. I, I live in Charlton. Mm -hmm. My wife grew up on a property on Real Drive. Uh -huh. And uh, our original, original intention is just to separate the house from the back. <coughs> and this road that we're, you know, talking about has been maintained by the owners from the beginning. We've never asked for help from the town. Uh, and we've done quite a lot of maintenance to it over the years. And uh, also the, the, uh, the people who live up at the end of the road, they've also done a lot of maintenance. And we also had it plowed privately uh, and paid all the taxes all those years. And we're only asking to, you know, subdivide some of the land so we can separate the house. And I, I think it's unrealistic to ask for a paved road. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of private ways in town that are, no, that are not paved. I mean, you know, to gravel it and make it accessible. And the, the police go up there, the fire department goes up there, uh, and the, the uh, highway department. And I, I know it, you know, over the years it does get rough and, and we've fixed it ourselves. I was actually down there two weeks ago. I took a ride down the road, and there was one whole part of that road that is caved in off to the side, and it was all filled with water when I went down, in, um, and I went down in my car, and it was, you know, I had to go all the way up the end to turn around. I have a small car. Right. There's nowhere to turn around. Once you're on that road, you have to go all the way up to the end uh, in order to, you know, make any kind of retreat um, from the area. And you know it's important that if you do put a house back there, that it's accessible by right. I understand vehicles, and you know that's really where we where we are. Right, I understand moment. that it hasn't had you know any major improvement for a while. Right, right. Just further, further regarding a uh, public road standard, the town wouldn't necessarily require this thing to be paved based on its current condition now. Uh, there's a difference between public and private road, obviously, just because the town plows it doesn't mean it's public road. They're right. doing it for emergency purposes, only because someone lives there. And the second we start adding something to it or modifying the site anyway, via this a &R or the special permit, we subject it to today's conditions and regulations. So and that's where the road improvements may become a factor. Mr. Brooks? I think they need to talk to the highway surveyor and see what his feelings are. And you would ask if he would, if in his thoughts it needs to be paved, that can be a nice high pack gravel road or some sort like that. The granting of the special permit is like a privilege or a you know, kind of a special thing, just what it says. We do. It's, it's not guaranteed, you don't have to do it, you have to meet several requirements. And it's something that came up, you know, when people had big pieces of land and a piece that could go up in the back and you could make a driveway. And, you know, we don't always get them that are. A, perfectly full fit into that category but you know we try to grant that if it's some kind of a thing and in this case it's only going to be one it's not going to saturate the area with houses so I think most people would here would be willing to work with it but we need to see something right. different than what this is and we've you know we've required others to be <coughs> in front of the board you know it's similar for these same types of outcomes so um, you know, we're not just singling out this property this is something that we we need to see happen. See, those yeah. people that live there, they live there for years, and they're used to it. Someone new might mm -hmm. 
Matt. Oh, I just had a question for you. Okay. Um, regarding the two lots, um, would you separate these off and do lot three on its own? We could do lot. We, we could have come in right now with with just one on an A and R. I think that the the primary um, what originally brought them in was to they got a whole lot of land back there that's just dead. Sure, sure. So the idea was to make this portion of the site, which is lot two is 11 acres, make this portion of the site somewhat valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the density in the front. You know, this is this is a bonus. This is what we really want. So, um, in an effort to um, use 11 acres of land. You know, we figured we'd put one house there. You know, and, and does that go down to the water? That you have piece? eventually. Because it can you say, I do know this that the, the topo seems to go up, but I don't know. Oh, it doesn't have front. Yeah, it doesn't have frontage down. on the water, but it's within a few feet of the water. But it's um, uphill first. It That's after yeah. the easement. It goes up and then drops down. Yeah, yeah and there's also so an easement there. Utility easement. Yeah. So that's what I hope was. Um, the next meeting is June 14th. Okay, so um, motion to continue the hearing to the June 14th meeting. Is that? Thank you. Thank you. Does that work? Yes. If you're gonna, yeah, you guys change that at all? Yeah, we're going to be coming in with with. Uh, these are just concept plans, so we're coming in with. Yeah. Motion to continue the meeting to the 14th of June. We'll make the motion. Second. Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seven continuous watches. Oh, yeah, sure. <coughs> I was trying to bite that, I was trying to hold that back, and I, I wasn't going to get it done. So thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And that will be at 705. Yep, 705. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Sorry, you lost. Yeah. Thank you. Low Impact Development Grant Report Review. Yes. Uh, uh, at the request, uh, not last meeting, but I believe the meeting, meeting before. Uh, we were reviewing the study that was given to us by Mass Audubon on our planning board uh, rules and regulations for subdivisions as well as the open space residential development bylaw and uh, at Jim's request to table this so we could review it and then have an opportunity to discuss it at a future meeting uh, or about absent last meeting so we tabled it over again so uh, we have an opportunity to discuss it so did you have any comments or no, no. Not, not really. I, uh, I read it, I didn't. Yeah. A couple things that, for discussion that I'd like to actually mention. Um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting there was the minimum required open space for these uh, residential subdivisions, which we got Thor score for. Um, we have a 30% open space requirement in RAR, B, and RC, and we have a 40% open space requirement in residential rural or the RR district. Um, best practice, according to the study done, is to have minimum open space of 75 percent. We have 100 acre parcel, 75 and, acres. And have cluster to be the houses more. Yes, and give uh, density bonuses to cluster those more. For more sustainable districts. development. Right. So you preserve the tracts of land and keep the development into a smaller area, but still have the same amount of units. Still have a lot of houses. You know, the only problem with, with something like that is the fact that a lot of this open space land you can't even get to. Yeah. So what the hell good is it? It's true. It's always been so, a contention. I spoke uh -huh. about it a lot when we put it in, but we called the cluster housing and that, and it was that so much of the land that we, that people wanted to give was the side of a hill, a cliff, a swamp, a pond, and <coughs> 
that's not really the intention when you say right. you're thinking about it. You want the intention is open space that people could go on, whether it's those residents that are in that neighborhood or those of the entire town or elsewhere that wanted to walk on the property or use it. And there's a lot of them that had, if they had 32 acres, 29 was this junk. Is what, <coughs> this is what happened on that uh, gem development. There's one prime example. You've got a nice pond to fish in there. Mm -hmm. There's no access to that pond except for the guaranteed open space as part of that project. Mm -hmm. However, you can't use the open space to get to the water. No, no. Oh, yeah. What to? Yeah. And, and why is that, Jimmy? Right. At the end of the cul-de-sac? <coughs> no, you can't. There's no way to get from. Well, he'll tell you. There's no way to get from the given land to the water. Right. There's no access. No. And that would have been a beautiful spot for, you know, kids to sure. take their little canoes and kayaks down there and fish. That's a great spot. So just simply saying, you know, 50% or 30% or 75% or whatever it is, whatever percentage it is, is not enough. Well, right. And I think we've put ourselves in that situation by having 30 or 40% to only get that scrap land. If we increase that amount, we might get some of that better land with it. And, and I think, well, is there area. an opportunity for any kind of a, you know, when you, when you, in the subdivision control us, that <coughs> you could require it, that it has to be, that's you know, a, I mean. That's a great segue. And then you get into a sticky wicket there, right? And to my, and to the other point here where it says um, the permit type. Now, we were, open space residential development is a special permit in our bylaws, under, under 4.2. The best practice is still required to be mandatory. In some towns, um, I think it's Northbridge, North Borough, it's one of those two towns, that when a subdivision developer comes to the planning board and they introduce their preliminary plan, they require them to provide them with an open space design and a standard development design so that the board can choose one for them to proceed to the definitive right. subdivision right. phase. Right. And that, yeah. <coughs> you know, you know what the best thing would be? That any land that is going to be used for open space be accessible, accessible from a public road. Hmm. That? I think it's a very valid point. But what if you had to climb a mountain? <laughs> if it's available by a public road, yeah. Yeah. and we approved it, well, that's the way it is. But we don't have any mountains in all. But needless to say, other than Grange, it's close up. Yeah. Yeah. It, the idea is that why take back land that can't ever be used? You know, it, it's mm -hmm. crazy. That's, uh, I think that's exactly what happens. And we had the opportunity with Camden <coughs> Woods, which is right next to the, the, uh, the gem project, yep. where there's 30% open space, but there's no access to it. So we're trying to convince town meeting or at some point to accept the, uh, the deed over to the town. And I said, what are we going to use it for? So that's, the, that's exactly the point. I think that's a that good, good idea. Mm -hmm. it might not be 75%. Mm -hmm but 60-ish or something mm -hmm. like that, because you want, I think, and then when you do that, you put, you really cluster in those houses in, mm -hmm. and you're then taking away a little bit of what it is to live in a rural area. Mm -hmm. And I think you might not get all of what you want <clears throat> the more that the houses are clustered. Mm -hmm. That okay. goes both ways, no, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I just, I'm back on that. So that goes both ways. You take it away from the people that are moving into the neighborhood, but you preserve it for the people who are already there. Right. But it, I think it's, it's important to remember when something says best practice, kind of best practice for what? And the goal of this is to preserve open space, um, but is, is it's not necessarily the best practice for Auburn. Um, and it, you know, I think you got to look at by making it a 75% minimum open space requirement. What does that do as far as changing the amount of lots that could have potentially been developed and now can't? Uh, but then also, what do the lots that are left over look like? Um, are they marketable? Are they things that people are going to want in town? Um, I think the idea of requiring that the open space be accessible by a public way is genius. I think yeah, that we should do that immediately. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, just, I think you really got to think about what 30%, 75%, how does that change our neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. um, and I, frankly, I think 30% is And do we, fine. you know, do we then start to look at other things like um, agri-development where we make, make that open space be a community farming type of, uh, you know, there's opportunity for that too. Helps maintain the rural, um, uh, the community, the rural phase of the community. How would you farm the land you can't get to? 
Well, right. again, exactly. Yeah, that's, right. Well, that's a right. problem. That's why I say if we Which had this, a good other, idea to have this other level, yeah. you know, we could have a community farm. Right? How would you add that in? How would you add that in as far as public access to open space? Either right into the OSRD bylaw or we put it into the planning board rules and regulations. Yeah, I, think, something we can add. I think we should try to do that right away. I think you should uh, require that it be accessed by a public way inside. Hmm? So people know it's. Mm -hmm. Because hmm. otherwise you have no idea where you're supposed when, to go. When you say community farm, who would it benefit and who would it be for? for well, the, the you typically, be, I mean, you know, the neighborhood. Yeah, the neighborhood. Yeah. 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 You want a community type, you know. Remember when the electric light yeah. company was giving uh, parcels under their mm -hmm. uh, power lines and you could claim a parcel and plant the garden under it? Mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah. was a couple of places in Western. Uh, That's right. Yeah. But anyway, so you're going to add that? Yes. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. That's great idea. Excellent. Thank you. That was my, those are my two big talking points. All right. Was there anything else that you wanted to <coughs> you zeroed in on? I'll let you want to be here. Just kidding. No, zeroed in on. Those, no. are, those are my two big points. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, so moving on to CMRPC annual meeting and upcoming workshops. Yes, thank you. CMRPC annual meeting. It's June. Yeah, because still anyone's going to. Huh? You waiting on that payment? Still. I think it's June 9th. Ah, I should have brought the date with me. But the annual meeting is uh, held at Leicester Country Club. Uh, there will be some guest speakers. At so it's around 5.30 or so, just about 8.30. But preceding that is a golf outing that uh, I think it's like 40 something dollars, 18 holes, and then there's food afterwards, and then a, and then the guest speakers and stuff. And if anyone's interested to attend that, let me know so I can do an RSVP. And so um, I take the money instead. Yeah. The um, tickets are free this year. Yep. For the Unless day. you're golfing, you pay for it. So, oh. so. And. Spouses, right. I guess you have to pay for your spouse, but I don't know who didn't like this. And do you know who the speakers are by any chance? I'm sorry, to put, I don't mean to put you on the spot, He's but yeah. I wish I'd put that He's in my Jack. packet, but J Ash, yeah, it's yes, okay. <coughs> that's correct. <coughs> and uh, I believe there's a service award given to Kelly Brown from the DOER for uh, work with the Green Communities in Central Massachusetts. So be, you know, she's been working with us a lot and really appreciate what she's done for us. In addition to that, one of the upcoming workshops uh, was actually canceled, so I don't need to talk about that one for everyone. And I mentioned this before, the Zoning Bylaw Review Committee has invited town departments and, and members of other boards to uh, provide feedback at their next meeting, which is Tuesday, 31st of May, I think it's Tuesday, yeah, next week. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's interested to, to attend and provide feedback on the registered marijuana dispensary bylaws, this is the last uh, feedback session we have before having a public meeting and presenting a document. Uh, if anyone wants to attend, let me know. Sit chair. And that's on the 31st? Yes, it's 7 p.m. in this room. meeting is on June 14th. If you don't have any correspondence, and make a motion to adjourn. Well, wait a minute. I got okay. One thing that I uh, find out through a uh, reliable source is the uh, Milbury, town of Milbury now has just uh, agreed to uh, uh, pay the planning board members for operation and um, I was wondering if you could check in on that. Oh, yeah. But I, under, I understand that it's a uh, $2,500 payment to each member of the sitting planning board. Something that I think that if it assists the towns of doing it, that Auburn basically should uh, get, look into that too. Okay. Sure, though, it's off the move. Mr. Brooks, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Brooks would go along with that. 
Does that apply to alternate members as well? <laughs> what? No, I just figured that, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's certainly worth pursuing. I wonder if Mulberry has a town planner, and maybe that's... They do. They do. They do. They, do. they, have a they, do. Yeah. they took uh, it out of his pay. <coughs> <Yeah. laughs> and they Which just increased... They, 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 and by the way, they just increased the stipend for the Board of, Sel the board of Selectmen to <coughs> 35. I'll, I'll look into that. I'll provide feedback on the next meeting. Good. <laughs> Some of us have heard that. Alright, motion to adjourn. Instead of some property listings. <laughs> Anything Make else? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.